This video is brought to you by Lord of Maps, creators of some of the most breathtaking maps you'll ever find. And they have a holiday sale going on right now. Stick around after the video for a special discount code for my viewers for lordofmaps.com. This tale begins in the days of Eldarion, son of Ergorn Elisar, of whom the histories have much to tell. One hundred and five years have passed since the fall of Baradur, and the story of that time is little heeded now by most of the people of Gondor. Here in the very lands of Emin Arnen, one who remembers the War of the Ring discovers that a new evil is on the rise. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover The New Shadow, Tolkien's abandoned sequel to The Lord of the Rings. Over the course of his life, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote no less than three versions of a sequel to The Lord of the Rings, each with minor changes and improvements over the version that came before. The story of the abandoned sequel and its creation comes courtesy of Christopher Tolkien's The Peoples of Middle-Earth, the twelfth volume of the history of Middle-Earth. J.R.R. Tolkien called his sequel The New Shadow, and in a letter in 1972, just fifteen months before his death, the author wrote, I have written nothing beyond the first few years of the Fourth Age, except the beginning of a tale supposed to refer to the end of the reign of Eldarion, about a hundred years after the death of Aragorn. Then I of course discovered that the king's peace would contain no tales worth recounting, and his wars would have little interest after the overthrow of Sauron, but that almost certainly a restlessness would appear about then, owing to the, it seems, inevitable boredom of men with the good. There would be secret societies practicing dark cults and orc cults among adolescents. Deep indeed run the roots of evil, and the black sap is strong in them. That tree will never be slain. Let men hew it as often as they may, it will thrust up shoots again as soon as they turn aside. Not even at the Feast of Felling should the axe be hung up on the wall." These words open the dialogue at the center of the new shadow, and are spoken by Borlas, an aging man living in the area of Pen Arduin in Gondor. Borlas is one of the few in Gondor who are old enough to remember the War of the Ring, even as a shadow upon their early childhood for he is the younger son of Beragond, who we meet in The Return of the King. Beragond was the guard of the citadel in Minas Tirith, who befriended Peregrine Took in his service of the city. The very Beragond who was forced to kill three of Denethor's servants, to prevent the lighting of Faramir's funeral pyre. He was a fiercely loyal man, and seems to have passed this quality onto his son. After the War of the Ring, Beragond and his family, his son Bergil, and perhaps by this time Borlas, would move to Emin Arnen, serving as the captain of the Guard of Faramir, Prince of Ithilien. And it is here that the new shadow likely takes place. Old Borlas is speaking to Ceylon, a younger man who had long been friends with Borlas's son. As Borlas unwittingly speaks aloud the promptings of his heart, the evil will ever spring forth if the complacency of men allows it. Ceylon enters into a conversation with Borlas that is equal parts philosophical, antagonistic, and mysterious. He mentions that Borlas is among those who are not content with enjoying their own fair garden with strong walls, but troubles his heart about his neighbors and the city and the realm and all the wide world. He can't simply live in his own small corner of peace and quiet. Ceylon also recalls a moment in his youth when Borlas rebuked him for stealing a fruit from his orchard. Orc's work, Borlas had called it. Ceylon reveals that he and his friends would later play and pretend to be orcs. It is clear that the memory and shadow of the War of the Ring was truly lost on this younger generation of Gondorians. Ceylon had even considered taking his friends to Borlas's orchard and cutting down his trees, so that he may think the orcs had truly returned. They go on to debate the morality of stealing an apple that is ripe versus one that is not. Are they equal deeds, 
or is stealing an unripe apple worse? For you have robbed the world of what will now never be. Ceylon compares men and orcs in the eyes of a tree. Would a tree view a man cutting it down and burning it as any better than an orc? Borlas counters that the evils of the world were entered into it due to the discord of Melkor, and that men did not come of this discord. They came after, a wholly new creation of Eru, the One. Men are his children, and they are given the right to use trees without pride or wantonness, but with reverence. There is indeed a difference between the wanton destruction of the orcs and the woodman who cuts the proudest tree to keep his children warm. Ceylon then confronts Borlas, saying that it was not of apples or orchards that Borlas spoke of when speaking of the dark tree. His voice sinks low as the sun sinks behind Mount Mindoluin. You have heard then the name. With hardly more than a breath, he formed it. Of Harumor. Borlas looked at him with amazement and fear. His mouth made tremulous motions of speech, but no sound came from it. I see that you have, said Ceylon, and you seem astonished to learn that I have heard it also. But you are not more astonished than I was to see that this name has reached you. For as I say, I have keen eyes and ears, but yours are now dim even for daily use, and the matter has been kept as secret as cunning could contrive. Who's cunning? said Borlas, suddenly and fiercely. The sight of his eyes might be dim, but they blaze now with anger. Why, those who have heard the call of the name, of course, answered Ceylon, unperturbed. They are not many yet, to set against all the people of Gondor, but the number is growing. Not all are content since the great king died, and few are now are afraid. Borlas and Ceylon engage in a back and forth, each holding their cards close to the chest, neither wanting to reveal much to the other first. Borlas asks what this growing unrest plans to accomplish. Ceylon responds by asking how Borlas came to know the name of Herumor. As we learned in my previous video on the Black Numenorians, there was also a Herumor in the late Second Age, who rose to power among the Haradrim. While this is obviously a different person in the Fourth Age, the name's meaning remains the same. Herumor is Black Lord. Finally, Ceylon says later that night, when it is full dark, he will pass by the eastern gate of Borlas's house. Should Borlas wish to have the answers to all his questions, he should dress as Ceylon will, all in black, and come with him. Left alone, Borlas's thoughts go to how this conversation with Ceylon started, a conversation about his son, Berelach, who lives near Pelargir, serving in the Gondorian naval forces. He had told his father of the disappearance of some of his fellow shipmen and a ship of the Gondorian fleet. Berelach had assumed these shipmen had left without leave or pilot and had drowned in the sea. But Ceylon had expressed doubt at this official view of events. The men were not unskilled. They were sons of fishermen, and there have been no storms off the coast for a long time. Finally, Borlas is left with his decision, to go with Ceylon to whatever meeting may lie in wait for him, or to stay. He debates what he may know of the situation. Is Ceylon part of this conspiracy, or is he an infiltrator? Surely he is not attempting to convert Borlas to darkness. That would be useless. For Borlas remembered the old evil of Sauron. Could Ceylon be a spy? Or is he luring Borlas into some kind of trap? Borlas says to himself, I am not a dotard yet, but death is not so far off that I shall lose many good years if I lose the throw. The thought crossed his mind even as he stepped over the threshold. Perhaps I have been preserved so long for this purpose that one should live, hale in mind, who remembers what went before the great peace. Scent has a long memory. I think I could still smell the old evil and know it for what it is. He enters the house, 
where none of the accustomed sounds of evening were present, only a soft, dead silence. He calls and there's no answer. He feels wrapped in blackness and suddenly he smells it, the old evil, and he knew it for what it was. With this chilling end, Tolkien closes out his brief look into what a Lord of the Rings sequel would entail. We are left to wonder, was Ceylon truly a member of this dark tree? What happened to the missing boat and sailors from the Gondorian Navy? Who was Herumor, leader of this dark tree? And what would Borlas find in his dark and silent house? In the end, these would remain among the great mysteries in the history of Middle-earth. I did begin a story placed about a hundred years after the downfall of Sauron, but it proved both sinister and depressing. Since we are dealing with men, it is inevitable that we should be concerned with the most regrettable feature of their nature, their quick satiety with good, so that the people of Gondor in times of peace, justice, and prosperity would become discontented and restless while the dynast descended from Aragorn would become just kings and governors, like Denethor or worse. I found that even so early there was an outcrop of revolutionary plots about a center of secret satanistic religion, while Gondorian boys were playing at being orcs and going around doing damage. I could have written a thriller about the plot and its discovery and overthrow, but it would be just that, not worth doing. While much of what we discuss here on the channel is focused on the lore and the canon stories in Tolkien's world, I think this new shadow shows us much about Tolkien the man. He understood that left unchecked, evil will arise to corrupt the hearts of men. That in a world marred by the discord of Melkor, evil could not wholly be removed from the world. But even more, Tolkien knew when to practice restraint in writing about the world he created. He acknowledged that the great peace of Aragorn's rule would have few great tales worth writing, for there would be no great evil for Aragorn and his people to come up against. But I think Tolkien also realized how depressing it would be to bring about a new great evil after such a huge and wonderful victory as the defeat of Sauron. Like Christopher himself, I have no doubt that a thriller of a tale with this setting and written by Tolkien would have been exceptional. Though I also agree with Christopher that his father perhaps had a deeper conviction that the vast structure of the story J.R.R. Tolkien created came to its true end with the downfall of Sauron. I for one am thankful that Tolkien was wise enough not to go through with a Lord of the Rings sequel. Too often I found they only served to take away well-earned and often happy endings, a price too great for what is promised, let alone delivered. Even setting his tale after the lifetime of his main heroes, Tolkien realized it was simply not a tale worth doing, and that the final days of the Fellowship and the fitting ends to each and every character were indeed how we should, in the end, leave Middle-earth. Now if you're looking for a great holiday gift for the Middle-earth fan in your life, visit lordofmaps.com. Originally hand-drawn, these maps feature locations all around the world in a fantasy style sure to be a great conversation piece. And right now, they have a buy one, get one 50% off sale for the holidays. Or you can use the code NERDOFMAPS to save 15% off your order. Visit lordofmaps.com today. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Jim Limber Davis, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.